Good morning and welcome to my father's place. The Lord has been so gracious to me to give me several words that I could really, he showed me how to very clearly express them. And I pray that by his power, they'll go forth. As a matter of fact, before I go any farther, I'm going to pray. Now, the title of my message is Greater Things. Greater Things. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that you are greater than any other thing in all of creation because you, with your Son, created it all. I just humble myself before you now because I can't deliver any of your words in my own strength or with my own understanding. But it is as you give understanding that we can speak the deep truths of you in simple ways. Jesus, you were the master of such things because you are God. You were God in the flesh on the earth. Impart to me the ability, I pray, to speak this word so clearly and simply that all who hear can understand and receive it. Holy Spirit, open hearts, open eyes, open ears, so they not only audibly hear and see, but that they heed what you are saying today. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Open eyes and open ears, open hearts. That's what we must have to receive from the Lord. But once we open our eyes and our ears and our hearts, oh, it's a never-ending reception. It's the best reception you'll ever get. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's a heavenly reception. It's not a dish, and it's not cable. <laughs> it's God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Greater things. I'm just going to read one scripture to you. And it's a scripture that many have puzzled over for a long time. Many theories exist about this. It's in John 14, verse 12. And Jesus says this to his disciples during the time that he's giving his final instructions before he is arrested and then crucified. And he says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Now there's two really important things. I could discuss the theories, but that would take me off on a rabbit trail, so I'm not going to do that. I want to stick right with what the Lord has shown me. There's two really important words in this one verse. And the two really, really important words is greater he will do. Greater the believer will do because. Greater because. Greater because. Now what could be greater than what Jesus did when he walked the earth. What could be greater than that? How could we, mere humans, mere humans, he was God in the flesh walking the earth. How could we, mere humans, do something greater than he did when he walked the earth? And so the Lord gave me a revelation about this a couple years back when we were living in Florida. And I was just reading it, and I was saying, Lord, I've heard so many theories about what that means, and I really, I want to know from you. And that was when he pointed out the words greater and because. Whatever this is, this greater thing, it is because he goes to the Father. Something's going to happen when he goes to the Father that makes us able to do a greater thing than what he did when he walked the earth, ministering. And that is almost beyond comprehension because he healed the sick, raised the dead, cleansed the lepers, cast out demons, made the blind to see, made the deaf to hear, 
set the captives free, caused the lame to walk, even lame from birth. What could be greater than that? And how could we do it? What on earth or in heaven would we be able to do or be empowered to do because he goes to the Father? We know that when Jesus went to the Father, he poured out the Holy Spirit because it was at that time he was glorified. Go back to John 7 with me. Verses 37 through 39. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet, or not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, for Jesus to be glorified, that meant that he was returned to his original glory, just like he prayed to the Father in John 17, that he returned to his place on the very throne of God. He returned to be seated with his Father in heavenly places. And so that is what it means for Jesus to have been glorified. And that had to happen before the Spirit could be poured out in this new way. There was... The Holy Spirit was in the Old Testament from the very beginning. He brooded over the waters and he came upon the prophets and they prophesied. And he was actually put into Bezalel when he was going to have to do all the design for the tabernacle in the wilderness. But that was for a particular task and that was for a limited amount of time. This was going to be something different. This was going to be something where the Holy Spirit would come and dwell in us. Where Jesus promises in John 14 that he and his Father would come and dwell in us. Where he says also in John 14 and again in 17 that he would literally dwell within us in a spiritual way. So that, in that upper room, that happened. In that upper room in Acts 2, The Spirit was given in this new way. The Spirit was given to remain in us, not just be upon us or be in us for a brief period of time where a particular task was to take place or not just come upon us so we would prophesy and then we're done until the next time he comes and prophesies and causes us to prophesy. So, each one of the 120 in that upper room at that time experienced a personal Pentecost. And there's a direct relationship between experiencing that personal Pentecost and doing greater than Jesus did when he was on the earth. We'll get to what that thing is, but the first thing God asked me to do was make bookends for each end of that truth that I'm going to tell you. Because... You need to understand what God worked in them in that upper room before you can understand the greater and the purpose for the greater. And at the end of this message, I'll speak of what the Spirit, what God works through his Holy Spirit again so that you fully understand the purpose of this greater that we will do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for giving it to me that way. So here's the first bookend. We must understand what the Spirit does and what he did in that upper room at that time when each of the 120 had a personal Pentecost. Praise God. There are several things that he did And you'll see in my notes the references to these, but some of these we're going to go to, too. So don't feel like you have to rush and write it all down. It'll be in the notes. Go to Acts 15.9 with me. And we'll see the first thing. We'll see the first thing 
that the Holy Spirit did to the 120 and to everyone who is baptized in the Holy Spirit. We'll start with verse 8 in Acts 15. Peter is explaining to the council at Jerusalem exactly what happened when Gentiles who were not on anyone's radar who was Jewish to receive anything from God, when the Gentiles were filled with the Holy Spirit, were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Peter testifies to them, and God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us in their own personal Pentecost in Acts 2. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Cleansing their hearts by faith. This is what God does through the Holy Spirit in a personal Pentecost. Cleanses, that is, purifies the heart. That is, no longer did the Gentiles, Cornelius and his household, and everyone who was touched, everyone who was baptized, no longer do they have a divided heart where part of them loves God and part of them loves the world. That was gone. It was all love for God. The heart was pure and no longer divided. The heart was pure in also in that it was made clean. The Holy Spirit doesn't come and dwell in dirty places. He cleans them up. And then he comes to dwell. Hallelujah. If you've ever been in a really dirty place, you know what it is. And you really don't want to stay around there because it's awfully dirty. Vermin and everything running around. That's what our hearts are like before he comes in and does a lot of house cleaning. Hallelujah. He's a real good house cleaner. So with their hearts no longer divided and with their hearts cleaned up, so there wasn't any junk in them anymore. There were no rivals for God in their hearts. God and God alone was who they loved. So that was the first thing God did in their hearts. The second thing God did in their hearts was he put his love in them, filled them right full of his love. We talked about this last week, the very love of God, the same love that the Father has for the Son that love, the love that they had to come up with a new word for, dug up an old one nobody used anymore for love, used that to describe this, which they experienced in that upper room individually in their own personal Pentecost. That love. And not only that, not only was that love in them, but because their hearts had been purified, Jesus him, himself would be in them. Go to John 17 for a minute. 26. Jesus prays to the Father and he says, And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. So not only did God the Holy Spirit, fill those in the upper room and those at Cornelius' house. Not only did he fill them with a purified heart and the love of God, but also Christ himself spiritually came to dwell within, just as he prayed to the Father. Hallelujah. That happened when they experienced the personal Pentecost, beloved. That's what God worked. And we'll get to the greater work by knowing this. The other thing that happened was in John 8. Let's go back there. Verse 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, 
and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. You will be free forever from slavery to sin. And that was accomplished when each of those in the upper room and those in Cornelius' house, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and filled and Jesus came in. So they were purified and he put his love in them and Jesus himself came in and they were set free from slavery to sin. They continued in his word. They were truly his disciples. And the truth set them free. Hallelujah. This is very good news. It's the rest of the gospel. It's the whole thing. It's not only that he marvelously and graciously saves us, from his wrath by belief in his son Jesus Christ but that God says I'm going to change your heart so that you follow only me and that with great joy and gladness glory to God the other thing that happened in that whole process was that they became partakers of his divine nature just as Peter says in 2 Peter 1, 4, and in that way we escape the lust of the world. We no longer lust after what the world lusts after. We seek God only. And he comes and dwells. Partakers of his divine nature, of his character, of his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his kindness, his goodness, his faithfulness, his gentleness, his spirit control, that we become partakers of his nature. We are not God, but we possess characteristics that are his. Hallelujah. Partakers of his divine nature. We become that. When all of this happens, when God comes in, when God cleanses by the Holy Spirit, when he fills us with his love, when Jesus comes in to dwell permanently, when we're set free from slavery to sin, then we become partakers of the divine nature. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit works such a change that Jesus promised that the disciples who had been out and about healing, raising, cleansing, and casting out would now become witnesses of him. That, the other things were a witness that Jesus had authority and gave that authority to the disciples. But they were not yet witnesses of him. They were still running here and there. They were still fighting amongst each other like I spoke of last week. They were still the self-centered. But something was going to happen through all this cleansing and the love of God and the Jesus coming in to dwell and everything. This was going to make such a difference that Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now at that time, they, couldn't e they didn't even know how far the earth extended. <laughs> but to the ends of the earth, to this very day, the Gospels they wrote have been preached and proclaimed to the ends of the earth by others who have experienced a personal and have had these things done in their heart. But I get ahead of myself. <laughs> so with all of this in mind, all of this that God worked in us, what greater work would we be able to do as a result? What greater would we be able to do than what Christ did when he was on the earth? For goodness sake, how could that be? Again, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do. The works that I do here on earth, he will do. He says to his disciples. And greater, the word works isn't in the original Greek. Greater, 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 he will do. Because I go to the Father. Greater, because. Greater, because the Spirit was going to be poured out. 
Greater because the cleansing was going to happen. Greater because Jesus was going to come in and dwell. Greater because they were going to be received. They would receive the very love of God and it would fill their hearts. Greater because they would be set free from slavery to sin. Greater because they were partakers of his divine nature. What is this greater thing that he's talking about? Glory to God. Oh my, 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 my. It would have to be a God thing. And it was something we had to be empowered to do when the Spirit was given. And at the time he said that in John 14, 12, the Spirit had not yet been given. There's only one thing, beloved, that Jesus did not do while he walked the earth that we who have gone through this cleansing, this purification, this filled with God's love, Jesus dwelling within. Only one, only one thing he did not do that we are empowered to do through all the work that God does when we have our personal Pentecost. And if you go to Acts 8, 17, I'll start to show it to you. We've laid the groundwork. We've finished the bookend. Here it is. We're here. 8.17. We'll start with 14 so you can get the sense of it. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them, Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. A baptism of repentance. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. That's the thing. That's the thing. That's the greater thing. Jesus did not do that while he was on the earth, beloved. Because it was not time. It was not time. He had to be glorified. He had to be seated with the Father. He had to have completed his work on earth so that all the rest of the things could be done in a human heart when the experience of personal Pentecost and then they could do this greater thing that is lay hands on other people so the same thing would happen to them glory to God go to the next one which is Acts 9 17 now Ananias was a follower of Jesus who had been filled with the Holy Spirit and the Lord spoke to him and said I want you to go to a house on straight street and there's a man named Saul there and I want you to pray. So he is baptized in the Holy Spirit. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, he says in verse 15 of 9. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he much must suffer for my name's sake. And in verse 17, so Ananias departed and entered the house and after laying his hands on him, oh, beloved, this is something Jesus did not do when he walked the earth because it wasn't time. Laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has, se has sent me to you so that you may regain your sight. <clears throat> Excuse me. You may regain your sight and be Filled with the Holy Spirit. That meant he was purified. That meant he was cleansed. That meant the love of God came into the heart of this man who thought he was doing God a favor by killing Christians, sending them to their deaths. That meant that Jesus himself was going to come and spiritually dwell in his heart. That meant that he was going to be set free from slavery to sin because by rejecting Jesus, he sinned against God. And by killing Christians. I tell you, a lot of people say I've sinned too great a sin to be forgiven. And I say, have you ever murdered any Christians? The Apostle Paul did, but God changed his heart and filled him up with himself. And now he is a partaker of, divine's of God's divine nature. And he goes about giving the same to others. Hallelujah. 
No one has sinned too great a sin for God to forgive. Hallelujah. No one is a lost cause. Hallelujah. He laid hands. This was something. This was the greater thing. This was the thing Jesus said, you're going to do greater. Because I go to the Father. Because when I go to the Father, I'm glorified. I'm going to pour out the Holy Spirit in this new way. You are going to experience a personal Pentecost. All these great things are going to happen in you so that you can go out and lay hands on other people and have the same thing happen to them. It's God's plan for building the church and nothing less. It's not about getting a bunch of people just saved when there's more. Saved is wonderful. Hallelujah. But it goes beyond that. There's more God wants to do. He wants to make that heart pure and clean. He wants to come in, he wants his 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 love to fill that heart. He wants to come in and dwell. He wants to set you free from slavery to sin, make you a partaker of him, his nature, so that you can go out and do the same. Glory to God. Acts 19. I'll read 1 through 7. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. These men from Ephesus, Paul didn't hesitate not only to baptize them in the name of the Lord Jesus, but to also lay hands on them so that they would be filled. He didn't wait. He didn't say, maybe a couple of years from now I'll do it. He did it right then and there. And they had that same purification. And they had that same love come in. And they had that same Jesus come in. And they had that same freedom from slavery to sin. And they had that same divine nature, beloved, come in. It is a greater thing than Jesus did because it wasn't yet time while he walked the earth. When he was glorified, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Personal Pentecost happened, and it's still happening today. Glory to God. So what we've seen so far is that it's by the laying on of hands. But I'll tell you what, do not limit God. He works in all kinds of ways. Go back to Acts 10, where Cornelius' house has quite an experience. Verse 44. Peter has come. Cornelius had a vision. And Peter had a vision that it was okay to go to Cornelius' house because what God calls clean is clean, whether he's a Gentile or a Jew. So he went and he began to speak the gospel to them. And while he was still speaking these words in 44, while he was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. All those who were listening to the message, the Holy Spirit fell just because Peter spoke, because Peter had experienced a personal Pentecost. All those things had been done in his heart so that he could go, and even his words carried such power, carried such anointing, that the Holy Spirit came and just did a mass baptism in the Spirit, just like in that upper room, just the same way as Peter later testified. And the house of Cornelius 
All of them, their hearts were purified. The love of God came in. Jesus himself came in. They were set free from slavery to sin. And they became partakers of the divine nature. Hallelujah. Why? So that all those in Cornelius' house could could join all those others, those thousands who had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who were going out and laying hands on others or just speaking the gospel with such anointing and power from God because these things had been done in their hearts that God said, I'm going to work those in all these hearts of all these who are hearing. I'm going to work that in in the heart of anyone you lay hands on for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. He did this so their hearts would be purified. Just like mine and Jeff's and anyone who's filled with the Spirit. He did this so that that his love would be in them and he himself would be in them. He did this so they would be no longer slaves to sin. He did this so that they would become partakers of the divine nature. He did that so they would turn around and fan out to everyone around them. And and everyone around them would experience a personal Pentecost through God working through them. Those living waters were flowing, beloved. Just as Jesus promised in John 7, 37 through 39. Because he had been glorified and the spirit had been poured out in this new way. Why? Why did he do it? So that all of these to whom this happened would become his witnesses. Wherever they are and to the ends of the earth. Wherever they are and even to the ends of the earth. Beloved, this video goes all over the world. When I go out and about, my only goal is God's goal. My only purpose is God's purpose. And that's there be a whole lot more like me in this world. Who, in whom God has worked. In whom God has worked. I boast in him alone, in whom God has worked amazing things in the heart so that we become his witnesses and so that we have the power from him in us to lay hands on or simply speak the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes and baptizes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what Paul was praying for the Ephesians. And I prayed that prayer last week. That they would be filled with all the fullness of God. They were already a church. They were already believers. But there was something else that needed to happen. And he prayed that. This is absolutely the purpose of what's often called the fivefold ministry. That is, there are apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, and they are to bring the body to maturity. Ephesians 4.13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, Wow, that much? That's a greater thing. That's a greater thing, beloved. All this laying on of hands, speaking, and people are filled with the Holy Spirit, and their hearts are cleansed, and all those wonderful things happen to them that I've been talking about throughout this message. That's the greater thing. That's the thing that couldn't be done until Jesus was seated on the throne, glorified, and poured out the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jeff once prophesied this at our local church. He said, God doesn't want 
a full church. He wants a church that's filled. God doesn't want every seat occupied. He wants every heart occupied by him. He wants to be the occupant of every heart. He wants to be the occupant of your heart today. Have you experienced a personal Pentecost? Then you're jumping up and down and rejoicing at this message. Saying, oh, praise God, somebody's speaking it. Yes! I always love to hear somebody speak the whole truth. It just makes me rejoice. Is your heart pure? Is the very love of God in your heart? Does Jesus dwell in your heart? Are you set free from slavery to sin? Do you have his very characteristic? Or are you struggling with sin, Christian? Are you struggling with sin, pastor? Are you struggling with sin, church leader? He's still doing personal Pentecost. He's still doing it. He will do it until he returns. Confess your sin. You cannot possibly preach this unless this has happened in you. And it is the whole gospel. You must be inwardly cleansed. You must have the love of God fill your heart. God's actual love, same love he has for his son. You must have Jesus dwell. This is the greater thing that I can do for you today because I know by faith that my words go out with power and that even as I speak this, the Holy Spirit, while you are sitting there, while you are repenting, while you are confessing, while you are seeking, while you are asking, seeking, and knocking, he will answer. He will answer. You will receive. You will find. The door will be opened. Hallelujah. That's not my promise. That's his. And then you'll be able to do something greater than Jesus did when he walked the earth. You'll be able to go around and offer the same thing. You will be able to go around and lay hands on people for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Believers. Because you can't receive the Holy Spirit unless you obey God. And that's in Acts 5. See if I've got the reference. Acts 5.32. Go there with me. I just want to make sure you know this. This cannot be just somebody on the street. 5.32. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So if there is one who is a believer who obeys God, that one, when you lay hands on that one, they will be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you speak, they will be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ happens. As Reinhard Bonnke says, when you speak the gospel, the gospel happens. Because you have had a personal Pentecost. It won't work unless you have. Hallelujah. You know, beloved, the Lord asked me to say this at the very end of this message. He wants you to get down right now and ask and seek and knock. He wants you to get down right now and confess your sin. And repent, turn from it. And he will indeed work personal Pentecost in you. But he wants me to say these things at the end. He, Jesus says, I didn't die for you so you could receive whatever blessings you think you deserve from God or that you demand from the Father's hand. He says, that isn't why I died for you. He says, I died and rose again so you could have a new heart. So everything you did in the past would be forgiven. And then you could have a new heart. A heart that is pure. A heart that loves nobody but God. And serves no one but him. 
when it obeys because it's filled with the very love of God and it's a great pleasure and a joy, a great pleasure and a joy to obey. The same love the Father has for the Son. He says, just as I prayed in John 17, 26. That's why I died and rose again, he says. And so you would be a vessel through whom the Holy Spirit could be given to many. Allow him today to do what only he can do. And this word and your life will open up to all the things of God. And you will be used mightily. You will become a witness right where you are and to the ends of the earth. Thank you, Father, that you have given us the gift of your love who follow after you, who cry out to you, who ask you that, Lord, someone who has had personal Pentecost will come. And Lord, that that person would be filled with you. I thank you so much that you want to come and dwell in us so that we might glorify you, so that we might say, oh, praise God, only he could do this in me. Thanks be to God for Jesus who came for that purpose, to forgive everything in my past and to cleanse me and fill me with the love of God and make me no longer a slave to sin and make me a partaker of his very flesh. Jesus, this is how you build the church. There is no other way. All of our church growth techniques are nothing compared to what this does. Hallelujah. This is how it worked in the beginning, and it hasn't changed. It works the same way. Personal Pentecost is absolutely essential. I pray. Holy Spirit, that you would make this go forth in your power. Lord, I thank you for giving me the Holy Spirit so that he could repeat to me what you say and I could say it that many might have this marvelous experience that is essential to the church. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.